Mr. McCoy here with part seven of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. As you recall, Susan said, Ooh, I thought he'd be a man. Is he quite safe? I feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. I'm longing to see him, said Peter, even if I do feel frightened when it comes to the point. That's right, son of Adam, said Mr. Beaver, bringing his paw down on the table with a crash that made all the cups and saucers rattle. And so you shall. Word has been sent that you are to meet him tomorrow, if you can, at the stone table. Where's that? said Lucy. I'll show you, said Mr. Beaver. It's down the river a good step from here. Uh, I'll take you to it. But meanwhile, what about poor Mr. Tumnus? said Lucy. The quickest way you can help him is by going to meet Aslan, said Mr. Beaver. Once he's with us, then he can begin doing things. Not that we don't need you, too for there's another of the old rhymes. When Adam's flesh and Adam's bone sits at Care Parable enthroned, the evil time will be over and done. So things must be drawing near their end now. He's come and you've come. We've heard of Aslan coming into these parts before, long ago, nobody can say when, but there's never been any of your race here before. That's what I don't understand, Mr. Beaver, said Peter. I mean, isn't the witch herself human? She'd like us to believe it, said Mr. Beaver, and it's on that that she bases her claim to be queen. But she's no daughter of Eve. She comes of your father, Adam's. Here, Mr. Beaver bowed. Your father, Adam's first wife. Uh, her they call Lilith, and she was one of the jinn. That's what she comes from on one side, and on the other, she comes of the giants. No. No, there isn't a drop of real human blood in the witch. That's why she's bad all through, Mr. Beaver, said Mrs. Beaver. True enough, Mrs. Beaver, replied he. There may be two views about humans, meaning no offense to the present company, but there's no two views about things that look like humans and aren't. I've known good dwarfs, said Mrs. Beaver. So have I, now you come to speak of it, said her husband, but precious few, and they were the ones least like men. But in general, take my advice, when you meet anything that's going to be human and isn't yet, or used to be human once and isn't now, or ought to be human and isn't, you keep your eyes on it and feel for your hatchet. And that's why the witch is always on the lookout for any humans. She's been watching for you this many a year, and... If she knew there were four of you, she'd be more dangerous still. What's that to do with it? asked Peter. Because of another prophecy, said Mr. Beaver. Down at Care Parval, that's the castle on the seacoast, down at the mouth of this river, which ought to be the capital of the whole country, if all was as it should be. Down at Care Parval, there are four thrones, and it's a saying in Narnia, time out of mind, that when two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve sit at those four thrones, then it will be at the end not only of the white witch's reign, but of her life. And that is why we had to be so cautious as we came along. For if she knew about you four, your lives wouldn't be worth a shake of my whiskers. All the children had been attending so hard to what Mr. Beaver was telling them that they had noticed nothing else for a long time. Then, during the moment of silence that followed his last remark, Lucy suddenly said, I say, where's Edmund? Where do you think Edmund is? Share what you think with your fellow listener. There was a dreadful pause, and then everyone began asking, Who saw him last? How long has he been missing? Is he outside? And then all rushed to the door and looked out. The snow was falling quickly and thickly and steadily. The green ice of the pool had vanished under a thick white blanket, and from where the little house stood in the center of the dam, you could hardly see either bank. Out they went, 
plunging well over their ankles into the soft new snow and went round the house in every direction. Edmund! Edmund! they called till they were hoarse, but the silently falling snow seemed to muffle their voices and there was not even an echo in their answer. How perfectly dreadful, said Susan as at last they came back in despair. Oh, how I wish we'd never come! "'What on earth are we to do, Mr. Beaver?' said Peter. "'Do?' said Mr. Beaver, who was already putting on his snowshoes. "'Do? We must be off at once. We haven't a moment to spare.' "'We better divide into four search parties,' said Peter, "'and all go in different directions. Whoever finds him must come back here at once and—' "'Search party, son of Adam?' said Mr. Beaver. "'What for?' "'Why, to look for Edmund, of course.' There's no point in looking for him, said Mr. Beaver. What do you mean, said Susan. He can't be far away yet, and we've got to find him. What do you mean when you say there's no use looking for him? The reason there's no use looking for him, said Mr. Beaver, is that we know already where he's gone. Everyone stared in amazement. Don't you understand, said Mr. Beaver. He's gone to her, to the White Witch. He has betrayed us all. Oh, surely. Oh, really, said Susan. He can't have done that. Can't he, said Mr. Beaver, looking very hard at the three children, and everything they wanted to say died on their lips, for each felt suddenly quite certain inside that this is exactly what Edmund had done. But will he know the way, said Peter? Has he been in this country before, asked Mr. Beaver. Has he ever been here alone? Yes, said Lucy, almost in a whisper. I'm afraid he has. And did he tell you what he'd done or who he'd met? Well, no, he didn't, said Lucy. Then, mark my words, said Mr. Beaver. He has already met the White Witch and joined her side and been told where she lives. I didn't like to mention it before, he being your brother-in-law, but the moment I set eyes on that brother of yours, I said to myself, treacherous. He had the look of one who has been with the witch and eaten her food. You can always tell them if you've lived long in Narnia, something about their eyes. All the same, said Peter in a rather choking sort of voice, uh, we'll still have to go and look for him. He is our brother after all, even if he is rather a little beast, and he's only a kid. Go to the witch's house, said Mrs. Beaver. Don't you see that the only chance of saving either him or yourselves is to keep away from her? How do you mean, said Lucy. Why, all she wants to do is get all four of you, she's thinking all the time of those four thrones at Care Parable. Once you were all four inside her house, her job would be done, and there'd be four new statues in her collection before you'd have time to speak but she'll keep him alive as long as he's the only one she's got because she'll want to use him as a decoy, as a bait to catch the rest of you. Oh, can no one help us, wailed Lucy. Only Aslan, said Mr. Beaver. We must go on and meet him. That's our only chance now. So what do you think's going to happen next? Share with your fellow listener. It seems to me, my dears, said Mrs. Beaver, that it is very important to know just when he slipped away. How much he can tell her depends on how much he hurt. For instance, had we started talking of Aslan before he left? If not, then we may do very well, for she won't know that Aslan has come to Narnia, or that we are meeting him and will be quite off her guard as far as that is concerned. I don't remember his being here when we were talking about Aslan, began Peter, but Lucy interrupted. Oh, yes, he was, she said miserably. Don't you remember it was he who asked whether the witch couldn't turn Aslan into stone too? So he did, by Jove, said Peter. Just the sort of thing he would say, too. So, worse and worse, said Mr. Beaver. And the next thing is this. Was he still here when I told you that the place for meeting Aslan was the stone table? And, of course, no one knew the answer to that question. Because if he was, continued Mr. Beaver, 
then she'll simply sledge down in that direction and get between us and the stone table and catch us on our way down. In fact, we shall be cut off from Aslan. But that isn't what she'll do first, said Mrs. Peaver. Not if I know her. The moment that Edmund tells her that we're all here, she'll set out to catch us that very night. And if he's been gone about half an hour, she'll be here in about another 20 minutes. You're right, Mrs. Beaver, said her husband. We must all get away from here. There's not a moment to lose. And now, of course, you want to know what had happened to Edmund. He had eaten his share of the dinner, but he hadn't really enjoyed it because he was thinking all the time about Turkish delight. And there's nothing that spoils the taste of good ordinary food half so much as the memory of bad magic food. And he had heard the conversation and hadn't enjoyed it much either because he kept on thinking that the others were taking no notice of him and trying to give him the cold shoulder. They weren't, but he imagined it. And then he had listened until Mr. Beaver told them about Aslan, and until he had heard the whole arrangement for meeting Aslan at the stone table. It was then that he began very quietly to edge himself under the curtain which hung over the door. For the mention of Aslan gave him a mysterious and horrible feeling, that as it gave others a mysterious and lovely feeling. Just as Mr. Beaver had been repeating the rhyme about Adam's flesh and Adam's bone, Edmund had been very quietly turning the door handle, and just before Mr. Beaver had begun telling them about the white witch that wasn't really human at all, and but half a gin and half a giantess, Edmund had got outside into the snow and cautiously closed the door behind him. You mustn't think that even now Edmund was quite so bad that he actually wanted his brothers and sisters to be turned into stone. He did want Turkish delight, and to be a prince, and later a king, and to pay Peter out for calling him a beast. As for what the queen would do with the others, he didn't want her to particularly be nice to them, certainly not to put them on the same level as himself. But he managed to believe, or to pretend he believed, that she wouldn't do anything very bad to them. Because, he said to himself, all these people who say nasty things about her are her enemies, and probably half of it isn't true. She was jolly nice to me, anyway much nicer than they are. I expect she is the rightful queen, really. Anyway, she'd be better than that awful Aslan. At least, that was the excuse he made in his own mind for what he was doing. It wasn't a very good excuse, however, for deep inside, deep down inside him, he really knew what the White Witch was and that she was bad and cruel. The first thing he realized when he got outside and found the snow falling all around him was that he had left his coat behind in the beaver's house. And of course, there was no chance of going back to get it now. The next thing he realized was the daylight was almost gone, for that had been nearly three o'clock when he sat down to dinner and the winter days were short. He hadn't reckoned on this, but he had to make the best of it. So he turned up his collar and shuffled across the top of the dam. Luckily, it wasn't so slippery since the snow had fallen to the far side of the river. It was pretty bad when he reached the far side. It was growing darker every minute, and what with that and the snowflakes swirling all around him, he could hardly see three feet ahead. And then, too, there was no rope. He kept slipping into deep drifts of snow and skidding on frozen puzzles and tripping over fallen tree trunks and sliding down steep banks and barking his shins against rocks till he was wet and cold and bruised all over. The silence and the loneliness were dreadful. In fact, I really think he might have given up the whole plan and gone back and owned up and made friends with the others if he hadn't happened to say to himself, when I'm king of Narnia, the first thing I shall do will to me make some decent robes. And of course, that set him off thinking about being king and all the other things he would do, and this cheered him up a good deal. He had just settled in his mind what sort of palace he would have and how many cars and all about his private cinema and where the principal railways would run and what laws he would make against beavers and dams and was putting the finishing touches to some schemes for keeping Peter in his place when the weather changed. First, the snow stopped. Then a wind sprang up and it became freezing cold. Finally, the clouds rolled away and the moon came out. It was a full moon and shining on all that snow, it made everything almost as bright as day. Only the shadows were rather confusing. 
He would never have found his way if the moon hadn't come out by the time he got to the other river. You remember he had seen, when they first arrived at the beavers, a small river flowing into the great one lower down. He now reached this and turned to follow it up. But the little valley down which he had made, which he came, was much steeper and rockier than the one he had just left and much overgrown with bushes, so that he could not have managed it all in the dark. Even as it was, he got wet through it all, and he had to stoop under branches, and great loads of snow came sliding off onto his back. And now, the time this happened, he thought more and more about how he hated Peter, just as if it had all been Peter's fault. But at last, he came to a part where it was more level, and the valley opened out. And there, on the other side of the river, quite close to him in the middle of a little plain between two hills, he saw what must be the White Witch's house. Something's coming. What do you think it's going to be? Share with your fellow listener. And now, moments more of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And the moon was shining brighter than ever. The house was really a small castle. It seemed to be all towers. Little towers with long pointed spires on them, sharp as needles. They looked like huge dunces caps or sorcerer's caps, and they shone in the moonlight and their long shadows looked strange on the snow. Edmund began to be afraid of the house. We'll find out what happens to Edmund and the others as the lion, the witch in the wardrobe continue.